Hey guys, welcome to The Disruptors, the podcast where we get the folks that are quite literally shifting the way we think about the future and building a better one. Today we've got one of them, Daniel Burris. Thanks for coming today, Daniel. Hey, my pleasure to be with you. So you've been a busy guy building businesses, writing books, and uh, I, I was looking you up a little bit earlier, and I thought you had one of the funniest names for a business I've ever heard of, the Midwest Skynosaurs. So I was curious what the story was. Yeah, yeah, that was, a, that was an interesting one. Um, I did that kind of as a fun thing, but it turned out to be quite, quite a business. So have you ever been to, uh, or any of our viewers or listeners, been to the coast where you've seen uh, guys with these steerable kites, these big kites with the two strings that come down, and uh, they're either they're surfing or doing something else. I'm sure a lot of you have seen that kind of thing. Well, back in uh, 1980, when I started that uh, company, um, all kites had one string. That's it. There were no two-string kites. They were all just one string. And I thought, well, you can't steer them. You can't control them. You can't do anything with a one-string kite. So I came up with a two-string kite that you could steer. And, uh, it, and we called them Skynosaurs. And uh, it was unbelievable how great it was. We had, uh, uh, had dealers all over the country almost right away. And uh, matter of fact, one of the ways of getting it going very quickly, I explained to uh, the network of, of uh, companies and dealers was um, give one to a couple of uh, high school kids. And uh, you know, to get, just give them out. And, uh, and when all their buddies want to know how they can get one, just uh, it says right on the, on the kite how to get it from your store. And two just went crazy. Solving, so when you ever see something with a two spring it. kite steering it, I started that whole thing going. And now we're all much better off and have way better childhoods. It's, uh, it's when you find those problems <laughs> and solve it. Have you always been an entrepreneur? Uh, no, I started out teaching biology and physics, uh, uh, but I must say I put myself through college playing lead guitar in a rock band, and I was my band. We actually made money. We did really well, and so I was entrepreneurial in that way, and uh, I, uh, at some point in my teaching, which I really did enjoy, I um, had an idea for an airplane design. So I spent a summer building it and test flying it, and it was an amazing design. So I ended up with 37 national locations in the first year on that business. And that's what actually brought me to the Midwest Skynosaurs, because I, came out, I was already in the aviation business. I already had all this dealer network, and I thought, let's give them something else to sell. <laughs> so if you're Richard Branson, you can start a plane company. You get somebody to lend you a plane and do it. But how in God's name do you start a plane company being a, being a high school teacher? Uh, well, I wasn't just a high school teacher. I was teaching everything from uh, university down to sixth grade during a period of eight years. Uh, first of all, just because originally I wanted to teach teachers how to teach science. And most teachers that teach teachers go through, get a PhD and have never taught. They just teach teachers. And I always believe, and this is part of being a good disruptor and an entrepreneur, that you go for the ideal. So in my mind, uh, the ideal was while I'm getting the advanced degree, why don't I teach a whole bunch of different areas? For example, I taught inner city and so on, so that I would have credibility as a teacher of teachers. So anyway, that's a little bit more than you wanted to know, but a little bit of background there. And um, when I started the, uh, the company, I did a couple of things that I teach in my books and in my writings, and that is, number one, uh, I knew I wasn't a business guy. I was, other than the college band, I was a science guy. So what I did was I made sure I didn't compete. So that's number one message, and that is don't compete. Competition is too difficult. The more you look at the competition, the more you act like them, the more you are like them, and the thinner your margins. So what I do is I looked at who I might be competing with so I knew exactly what not to do, which left me everything that they weren't doing, which is always a lot. And uh, the second thing I did was I problem skipped like crazy. Uh, and problem skipping is a major principle that, again, I teach in my books and in my writings and speaking. And that is whatever problem you've got, that's not it. There's another one. You've got to dig down to find the real problem so you can solve it. And uh, so that's one way to skip problems, or you skip them all together. In my case, get finding a Richard Branson or somebody with deep pockets, getting people to invest. 
Well, I skipped all that. I didn't use banks, didn't get investors. Uh, I did it on uh, getting the parts that I needed, put them together, had my design. I didn't pay somebody to design it. I designed it myself. Didn't have to pay for a test pilot. Hey, I was the test pilot. And, uh, you know, I mean, hey, it was a shoestring. But, wow, it uh, literally took off. And, um, and then I, there already were these fixed base operations all over the country, which means those are the little airports where they teach you how to fly. And I made all them my dealers uh, because it was the perfect market. I don't want to get into too much about flying because I've started six companies uh, in a wide variety of fields. And I've been the disruptor all along. And I know that's the subject of your, of your discussion. And I just got to give you an insight on this right off the bat right now. I'm changing the subject from what about me to now about all of our listeners and giving them something to think about in disruption. And I've used it myself. And that is, disruption is seen as negative. Well, it's only negative if you're the one getting disrupted. Uh, it, 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 Jeff Bezos from Amazon doesn't think disruption is negative. He likes it, as a matter of fact. You see, that I, I think you have a choice. In today's world, you only have two choices. You're either going to be the disruptor or the disrupted. There is no middle. And some companies, some organizations, some professionals would say, wow, we got disrupted last year big time. Glad I got that over with. <laughs> and I'm saying, no, it's like standing at the shore of an ocean. And, the, and there isn't one way. There are multiple waves that come in. We have many waves of disruption. You've only seen the beginning of disruption. And by using what I hope we have a chance to talk about, and that is uh, the certainty that comes from hard trends, you can actually see the disruptions before they disrupt, giving you the choice to be this disruptor or let yourself get disrupted. So what I'm saying is a couple of things. Number one, disruption is a choice when you have a little learning and you understand how to spot it ahead of time. But you're only going to be one of two, the disruptor or the disrupted. Secondly, I'll call it positive disruption because anyone that's disrupting is, tends to be finding a business or a process or a service where there's a lot of friction or customers are not delighted and, and they're just, in many cases, bored. Wonderful. In other words, they need to be disrupted. So I would like to think of all of the people listening to this, I would like you to become a positive disruptor, not a disruptor, because disruptor is just seen as negative. No, 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 that's, that's not negative at all. It's using usually technology or some, some new game changer in some way to enable people to do things that even know was possible. Uh, let's take brick and mortar retail sales. Frankly, boring. Most of the people in those stores didn't, uh, didn't know as much about the, uh, the thing they were selling as you did going in, and you know it. Uh, even when you were buying a car, you probably knew more about the car than the guy selling you the car. They deserve to be disrupted because they were coasting. And you can't coast uphill before gravity takes over. Well, gravity is hit. So what I would like to suggest is uh, those brick and mortar places weren't uh, redefining the customer experience. Uh, they weren't uh, surprising and delighting their customers, which you should be doing all the time. And there's new ways of doing that. So to kind of wind this up and then let you ask me some more questions to give you a chance to talk here. Sorry about that. All um, good. Uh, all right. Okay. Uh, thanks. I, um, let's take brick and mortar for a minute, which is under siege by Amazon and others. If you are a CEO of a brick and mortar uh, chain, of retail stores. And your view of the future is, well, the good old days of retail are behind us. You might close 120 stores. By the way, that's what the CEO of Sears is doing right now as we talk. On the other hand, if you think the good old days of brick and mortar retail are actually ahead of us, they just don't look like the days behind us. Uh, you might open 3,000 brick and mortar stores like Amazon is currently doing. Uh, you might buy Whole Foods, as Amazon did. Or you might be Waverly Parker that makes uh, glass frames that was an online-only uh, retail, uh, or not a retail, online-only e-commerce business that's opening up hundreds of stores. 
all over the country and many other e-commerce only sites are opening up brick and mortar stores. Why? Because they're reinventing it and redefining it using new tools. They see a different future. So I would say that disruptors, and I surely have been one, I'd like to consider myself a positive disruptor. Uh, I have seen where things can be better. And here's what I love about the planet Earth that we all inhabit. Everything could be better. Everything. Everything. Those earphones you're wearing, the microphone that I'm using, the computer that we've got, the flashlight that you have, whatever you got, it can be better. Always. It can, but that brings up the difference, sus basically sustaining innovation versus disruptive innovation. How do you view the two and how can you tell ahead of time before you're dead? Yeah, very good idea. Um, well, sustaining innovation uh, is a continuous process of redefining and reinventing. Because in the past, uh, technology seemed to be going fast, but actually compared to today was going slow. We have uh, you know, all of these exponential tools at our uh, disposal. I've, for over 35 years, uh, I've been talking about AI and other exponential tools that we can use uh, to be a positive disruptor. And exponential doesn't create a graph that looks like this. I think our people can see that. Uh, in other words, a straight line going up. Um, it creates kind of like a hockey stick look which means in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s, uh, exponential technology was moving along pretty fast, but it wasn't in the holy cow phase like we are today. Now we're almost going vertical with that. Things that we're doing today were impossible just two years ago, and we'll be doing two things two years from now that are impossible today which means uh, I need to redefine and reinvent rather than do what most disruptors have done historically, and that is they come up with an innovation and they milk it. Instead so of redefining and reinventing it. You see, you gotta be disrupting yourself. Be why? Because someone else is gonna do it for you if you don't. And that's a continuous process in today's world. Most of us, uh, you know, we come up with something great, I was just talking to a CEO last week who said, we are a very innovative company. And I had done a little research on this company before talking to him. And I said, yeah, when is the last time you did something innovative? After we talked a little bit, it was like 10 years. I said, you're not an innovative company. You were an innovative company. And you're about to get disrupted because you're not innovative. You see what I'm talking about? So to answer your question, we, as soon as you come up with your disruptive thing, whatever it is, you need to take it to the next level and the next and the next and redefine and reinvent it around what I call the hard trends that are shaping the future. And you know, before we're done, I'm hoping you ask me what are those because I think they can, they can help our, our people uh, disrupt with confidence. Let's jump there now. And what's the difference between hard and soft trends? Well, uh, there's no shortage of trends. That's why most people don't look at them. Why? Because some work and some don't. It's like going to Vegas. How do you know? But again, because I have a science background and I've been doing this for over 35 years and I've come up with a way of separating all trends into one of two categories. I call them hard trends versus soft. A hard trend is based on a future fact. It will happen. It's not an if or a maybe. Definitely going to happen. And the beauty of a hard trend is you can see disruption coming before it disrupts. Let's face it, uh, did the people that really promoted digital photography say, hey, let's keep it a secret from Kodak? The answer was no. They protected and defended film for uh, over a decade, losing a lot of money protecting and defending it. Same thing is true whether you're a Sony or a Microsoft or an HP or a Dell or anyone else that's been disrupted. And that is our first instinct is to protect and defend the old. And I would say, get over it fast. So there's these hard trends, and we can talk more about it in a minute, but let me tell you the other kind, and that is a soft trend. And a soft trend is not based on a future fact that will happen, it's based on an assumption that might happen. And by the way, I love soft trends and I love hard trends. Why do I love a soft trend? If you don't like it, you can change it. 
Why do I like a hard trend? Because you can see the disruption before it disrupts. Change can become your best friend. And you can use it to disrupt with low risk because if you don't do it, someone else will. It's there to happen. Um, and uh, so they, uh, let me give you a quick example. We've got uh, 4G now. Most of our listeners and viewers uh, know that 5G is coming out. Let me ask you something. After 5G, is that it? Well, no, no you already know. 5G. Yeah. No one even knows what 5G is. So I th imagine they'll come up with a 6G. Well, of course. There'll be 6G followed by 7, followed by 8. Now, back in 1G days, I was predicting when we'd have 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, how powerful they would be when they would come out using the things that I teach in my books. And, uh, and it's been accurate. Why? Because it's based on hard trends. They're fully predictable. I mean, we're putting a lot in the cloud. Is the cloud getting full? No, it's not a fad. They're going to put more in the cloud. Uh, as a matter of fact, the only way you can be secure is to be in the cloud. Just before this interview, I was talking to one of the largest defense contractors because I'm doing strategic work with them. And, uh, you know, they five, six years ago, they weren't in the cloud because it wasn't secure. Now they realize being out of the cloud is the way to be insecure. So what's the point of that? Things are changing fast. Is your opinion based on an old reality or a current or new reality? Part of, the, part of the question I would have is, all hard trends are soft trends, time dependent. The question is, can you determine the time? If you're investing in a company and you're too early, you lose money. If you're too late, you lose money. If you're right on the ball, you hit Uber. How do you think about timing? Got that down and uh, teach that as well. Not only the what will happen, that's the hard trends versus the soft trends, but the when is there. And I've got thousands of predictions. Remember, I've written seven books that have been bestsellers, thousands of articles, uh, and I've had an amazing track record of being right over the 35 years. By the way, how do I do that? I leave out the parts I can be wrong about. In other words, I separate the hard from the soft, like I want you and our listeners and viewers to do. So let me tell you how you do that. Since you ask, let me give you an answer. Back in, um, way back in the dark ages of 1983, when I started this research company and started writing and consulting and speaking, I came across uh, something called Moore's Law that most people know today. And Moore's Law was very obscure back in the early 80s, although today it's fairly well known. And that is, it said, processing power of our computer chips double every 18 months as the price drops in half. And because I was a science guy, I thought, hey, that guy nailed it. So imagine, 35 years ago, I'm looking way out at the year 2000 from the year 83. And using Moore's Law, I knew how powerful a computer would be and how much it would cost way out in the year 2000. Well, if I know how powerful it is and how much it'll cost, I can predict how you might be using it. And by the way, I did. I was right. I'll give you a quick one. In 1983, I predicted in the year 2000, we would sequence the human gene genome. By the way, we did in the year 2000. That was a 1983 prediction, and, the, and they didn't even start trying to do it until 1990. Yet I was able to use my process to do that. But we've gone beyond more because back then I didn't just use Moore's law. I needed two other laws to make it all work. And so I had a law of storage and a law of bandwidth. Storage is like your uh, hard disk drive or now your solid state drive or the cloud. Bandwidth is like the 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G. Uh, and when you take the computing power coupled with the storage coupled with bandwidth, all going at an exponential weight, those three come together are amazingly predictable. For example, Apple Computer. We all know when they launched the iPhone, that first iPhone, it was a game changer. Well, why didn't they launch it a year earlier? And I know Apple, and I can tell you exactly why. Uh, the three, I call them the uh, three digital accelerators, they weren't ready yet, meaning the hardware was there. You could buy it. They could sell it to you. But the user experience would have, frankly, sucked, would have been terrible. Those three weren't ready yet. But because they're on a predictable path, they knew exactly when they would be ready. And they were ready to launch right at that time. 
I'm sure a lot of our people that's listening right now are wondering, where's the next big thing from Apple? I mean, you know, they're a trillion dollar company and we're sitting here waiting. What, what are they waiting for? I can tell you right now what they're waiting for. They're, they got so much money, it's amazing. And they've got great stuff they're about to give you. But if they gave you that really great stuff before those three are ready, you aren't going to like it. So they're just about to the point of being ready for that next big thing. So even though Apple's already got it worked out, they can't release it to you yet because they're waiting for that curve, predictable curve, to get there. So that's how you take the, the risk out of it. You know the what will happen using hard trends separating from the soft, and you know the time frames. When you got the time frames, all of a sudden you can make good investment decisions. One last thing to tie into the question you asked, because it was a great question and there are many elements to it, and that is risk. Because as an entrepreneur, there's always risk. But if your strategy is based on the certainty that comes from a hard trend, the bigger risk is in not doing it. Because you know it's going to happen anyway, and if you don't, someone else will. So strategy based on certainty has low risk. On the other end, strategy based on uncertainty has high risk. So one of the key things that all of us should be doing as disruptors, positive disruptors, is looking at what are the hard trends versus the soft trends. And now that I have that list of hard trends, what are the related opportunities, knowing that's going to happen anyway. And what are the time frames using those three digital accelerators so I can see when they're coming out. And then I can look at how can I disrupt and, and, uh, and do it without having to spend a lot of money. And that's where some of the other principles I teach in the anticipatory organization, my latest book or the one before that, Flash Foresight, I talk about problem skipping and other things that you can do so that you don't have to be a Richard Branson to do something quite amazing. Yeah, it's capping the downside, but having unlimited upside. Before we get into the hard trends, which I want to jump into, what are, what are, two, what are one or two of the biggest predictions you've been wrong on? Wow, that's a tough one. Um, because I've used hard trends and soft trends most of this time, I haven't had a lot of wrong. Um, I think the biggest one probably was, uh, and one of the few, was around superconduct superconductors. Um, I know that's a little abstract and it's pretty technical for most of us, but back in 83, I could see uh, the progress of what superconductors could do, which could give us amazingly inexpensive electricity because of how we transport that electricity from place to place. It would be a game changer for power grids, in other words. And, uh, but it has to be closer to room temperature. Uh, and it's been slower to get the room temperature to give us the big deal. Getting closer now, but it's taken longer than I thought it would. Uh, the biggest mistake, though, I ever made in my speaking, and I've given close to 3,000 speeches around the world over the last 35 years to uh, a wide variety of companies and organizations, and that is, I'll tell you, my, the one that I would consider a failure. Um, and that was not around predicting. It was the human side, because usually that's where you end up with difficulty, uh, not so much that it, the predicting the technical side. In this case, I was speaking in 1986 to the 40 top executives of IBM. And I had a half an hour, I had four hours with them in a big semicircle. And one of the things I was doing was talking about the predictability of their business. Because at that time, it was all mainframes and hardware. That was their business, it was hardware. And I was helping them to see based on the hard trends and those three digital accelerators that starting in the early 90s, it would start shifting their profits would be shifting from hardware to software and services, but they would still be making the hardware. That's just not where the new margins would be. So they were gonna become more of a software and service company that also had hardware. And they all were stimulated, they liked the speech, but I could see in their eyes they weren't gonna change, they weren't gonna do anything. And it wasn't until 1993 that IBM almost lost the business some of us that are old enough might remember that, uh, where the whole thing tanked because what? That shift happened. And the good news is they ended up buying a lot of my books after that, and they started uh, hiring me to help them out a little bit more because they realized, whoa, the guy was right. Once again, 
it isn't about me being right. I'm a teacher at heart. It's really what I was put on the planet to do. That's why I'm writing books. Uh, that's why I give speeches. I want all of us to be what I call anticipatory versus reactionary. And you do that by learning the hard and soft trends. And it's not just anticipating disruptions before they disrupt, which you can do, and game-changing opportunities before those are seen by others. But also, you can use anticipatory hard trends to predict problems that haven't happened yet, both for you personally, as well as your company, your organization, or whoever you work for, and you have the choice of pre-solving it. You see, since our world is, ex the change is accelerating at exponential rate, if all we do is are agile, which is reacting quickly after disruption, which is reacting quickly after a problem occurs, we're not gonna be happy campers on this planet Earth going forward. I want us to go beyond agility and actually be anticipatory and pre-solve predictable problems so we don't have them in the first place. And one last tip on being a positive disruptor. Well, it may not be my last tip, but at least in this conversation I'm having right now, and that is one of the best ways to see a big opportunity for you as an entrepreneur is to look at potential customers and look at what are the predictable problems they're going to have. That's where you're going to see that low risk, new game changing innovation you could create. In other words, I'm going to create the solution for a problem you haven't had yet, but I can see exactly when you're gonna have it. And when I have the solution ready, is right when the problem is hitting you between the eyes and you're gonna go, wow, how did you ever do that? Well, what are those problems for humanity? Because a lot of them will be consistent across continents, across companies. What are the trends? Um, well, those are, that, it's really a great question. And uh, again, keep hard and soft trends in mind. Um, there, a lot of the biggest problems humans are facing right now are on the soft end which means we can do something about it. That doesn't mean we will, but it means we can affect that. Let's take uh, climate change. I know there's a lot of debate about who's causing it, and there's a lot of politics around that, but if you get rid of and, and just put aside all of the debate about, you know, is it humans or who is it? Hint, it is. But anyway, uh, if we put all that aside, if you travel around, and I surely travel all over the place, uh, I can tell you right now, oh yeah, it's real, absolutely. I mean, we're starting to open up the Arctic to shipping now, so hey, something's happening. My point being, uh, we could do something as a uh, population on the planet Earth, and we could do something as other countries working together as have tried in the past to do, to, uh, uh, lessen the impact and even reverse some of the issues and problems that are taking place. But it's soft because remember, a soft trend is not a future fact. Will we? I don't know. Uh, but there are a lot of problems we could pre solve, and there's a lot of opportunities in that pre solving. Um, just like there's a lot of diseases that are moving up from the tropics to now the northern latitudes brought to us by insects and other things that normally aren't in these upper latitudes. That's why you need all those shots when you go to tropical places or Africa and all that. They've got all these things that we don't have in the latitude that we're in. But that's changing. That's changing fast. Now, that, of course, presents an opportunity for drug companies and uh, other people that are looking at, you know, what are the predictable problems that people are going to be facing they don't have now, and maybe we should start developing some drugs for that ahead of time, which, by the way, is happening. Uh, or we can look at, do we really want that to happen? And what would it take for us to slow that and change that? And uh, I'll give you one more comment around that because it impacts a lot of things. And that is back in the early 2003, four bracket, um, I, uh, I noticed an interesting statistic that China was building uh, 15 new coal power plants a week in China back at that early 2000s, a week. Weak, whoa, and they didn't have pollution controls on them. Heavy, bad stuff. 
And it was pretty easy for me back then to predict China's going to have an air quality problem in Beijing and Shanghai. They're going to be choking on their air because look at what they're doing. You can see that. And I said, now we can pre-solve, they could pre-solve that problem and realize we're going to be choking on this air and we're going to have major lung health problems as all of us get older because of that. Or we can pre-solve the problem and look at other alternatives other than the very bad quality coal that they have in China with no pollution and put pollution controls on it and look for alternatives. My prediction back then uh, was they're uh, based on the hard trend that they're building all these plants, that they're going to have a lot of problems and eventually they'll become very green. But unfortunately, they'll not do it out of opportunity, which they could have done if they were anticipatory. Instead, they're going to do it out of crisis. And I've been to my first trip to China was back in the early 90s. And I can tell you, if any of you have ever traveled to China recently, you know, it's extremely bad. India, by the way, is similar. And uh, what are they doing now? Well, they're going green big time. They're, they're uh, why? Because they're dying. You got a choice. See, but that's out of crisis. Could have seen that way back in the early 2000s like I did, because it was there to see. It was there to predict. They didn't have to play that out, but they did. My point is, what else are we playing out we don't have to play out? What are the things that we got 78 million baby boomers in the United States? Hard trend, they're gonna get older. Um, there's a lot of predictable problems around that. We could either pre-solve or just let them play out. I would like us to start pre-solving and realize there's entrepreneurial uh, things that we can do that could help us and help them with that. And I could give you an idea of one right now that isn't being done that anybody listening to this could make a lot of money on. Would you like mm -hmm. to hear that one? We'll take it. All right, good. By the way, you should do that when you're off air. This is a good one. Uh, all right, we got 78 million baby boomers getting older. 10,000 people a day in the United States are retiring. I mean, think about the volume. And <clears throat> I, how about, as a new product, this doesn't exist, a smart watch for the elderly, and I'm talking 80 years old and older. Now your first thought is, well, they're not gonna buy a smart watch, they're 80 years old or older, they don't care about smart watches, and I would say, you're right, they're not gonna buy it, you're gonna buy it for them. And why are you gonna buy it for them? Because if grandma is 95 and she fall, and if her smart watch rapidly moves four feet, what happened to grandma? She probably fell, because it's got a little accelerometer in it, they all have those. And uh, does grandma need to know she fell? No, she's on the floor. Who needs to know? You, if it's your grandma. And let's say that grandpa is getting a little forgetful and he takes hikes outside, but he gets lost. Can't find his way home. What does grandpa do? Just ask his watch. How do I get home? His watch tells him, walk a block to the right and go to the right. By the way, where is grandpa? Oh, I can see him on my phone, that little red dot leaping on the map, right next to the lost dog. Hey, I can solve that problem too. Um, and of course, we know there's heartbeat and other things in those smart watches. Something most of us don't know, but I'll give you a little early reveal as a benefit for watching the show. And that is uh, the Apple Watch also can do blood oxygen level. Uh, they haven't told you about that, but it is something they can indeed do. So what am I suggesting? This is going to be big. There is no watch for the elderly right now, smart watch. Do you think there's going to be one? Oh, it's already made. You can see just from the style of Apple that it's designed for designed for old people. It's not for the new. It's not for the younger generations right now. Yeah, but I'm I'm talking now about a specific watch designed for the elderly that is designed for them, not just an Apple Watch that other people wear and a lot of twenty year olds and thirty year olds and forty year olds wear. That specific one that helps solve their specific problems doesn't exist yet, but that could be really big. So that'll be done at some point. And you can use off-the-shelf parts and off-the-shelf pieces to put it together to form a unique solution for the elderly. Anyway, just a thought. And it's a, it's a super helpful thought, just looking at those trends. I think when, when I think about it and when I hear how you speak about it as well, I think you would probably concur. The big problems that we have with humanity aren't being solved by governments. Governments seem to be, in essence, putting their heads in the sand. Well, that's not actually something ostriches do. It's a good enough metaphor. People like to avoid the problems that are coming without thinking about them. 
the only ones that really think about them are the entrepreneurs doing it for the incentive of making shit tons of money or in some way improving the world. Well, uh, it's excellent comment. And I would say that uh, you can make a lot of money and not improve the world. That is an option and a lot of entrepreneurs do that. But I, I would like us all to rise up a little bit, play our A game and make a lot of money doing something good for others because you can do that as well. So I think you can do something that's very positive disruption. And there's so many subjects to pick from. It's all right there for us. And you can make a lot of money doing it as well. Uh, you gotta be careful what you look for, because if the goal is just money, you may end up uh, going down a road that, uh, yeah, that may not be so good. I know uh, a guy, I know I live in San Diego most of the year, and I know a guy there that, you know, if he wanted to write a billion dollar check, he could do it. Um, but you know, his, his kids don't know him and, and don't like him and the family. I mean, it's, it's, it's not a happy life, but why? Well, he, he wanted to make money. It was all about money. And unfortunately you got to watch what you look for. You might get it. Uh, and did, did that bring happiness? Well, that's another subject. So instead of money being the goal, why don't you step back and say, look, every thing can be redefined and reinvented. And we're in an exponential time period that's unique to human history right now. This time we're in right now, this right now, not five years ago, right now, there's more opportunity than ever on the face of the planet Earth for anybody. And the tools are inexpensive. Uh, all it needs is our creativity, to, uh, to be, which is unlimited, to think through and look at what are the problems. And again, knowing what the real problem is, I've got a method for getting down to what that real one is and not solving the wrong one. Uh, and then uh, creating that solution, which will indeed bring you money. I'd put it this way. I was speaking, uh, I was a commencement speaker not long ago, and I freaked out all the parents probably by saying, I don't want you, meaning speaking to all of the graduates, the thousands of them, said, I don't want you to focus on being successful probably made the parents all upset for a moment. I said, because success is all about you. It's all about your degrees. It's all about the accolades, all of your accomplishments, how much money you made. Um, that's actually much lower level than what I'd like you to do. Instead of focusing on living a successful life, I'd like you to focus on living a significant life. Because when you do things that are significant, it's focused on others, not on you. And if you do things that, and if you up your game on the significant things you do, you'll find yourself making a lot of money anyway. So uh, in other words, instead of money's the goal, it should be more an accolades and my accomplishments. It's more about what are you doing to do something significant with your life? Uh, and by the way, that will give you far more meaning than just focusing on personal success. And you won't burn out while doing it. What, uh, what technology are you most excited about today? Any specific one? Ooh. There are so many, uh, because again, I track all biology, chemistry, physics. I'm looking at genetics. I'll, I'll give you two. I mean, like, oh, all right, all right. Uh, first of all, and by the way, everything that's got an upside has an equal downside. Know that. And the key is uh, there's going to be people using things negatively, but that's not us. We will use them positively to do the positive things. And uh, one that comes to mind very quickly is CRISPR which is a genetic uh, gene altering uh, tool that could be used to uh, solve amazing health problems on the planet Earth and uh, food problems on the planet Earth. Could, uh, there's over 4,000 genetic diseases. We could eliminate a lot of those. We could do amazing things with that. Um, but we could also do some very bad things with that. But it's a very powerful tool. It's actually quite simple and yet game-changingly powerful. Uh, the other one, I think, is uh, what we can do with machine learning today, which is a, a subset of artificial intelligence. And I think uh, a lot of us think that um, there's not going to be a role for humans in the future. It's all just going to be AI and we'll all be out of jobs. Uh, and to give you a little entrepreneurial insight around that, uh, again, I taught biology at one time, so let me put it this way. Um, we're going to have a symbiotic relationship with AI going forward. Symbiosis means you have two separate creatures, but they need each other to survive. 
In this case, it's AI and us. We're gonna need each other going forward. So let me give you a quick example so we can nail this concept, because I think it's an important one for us to understand. And that is, uh, right now, uh, the latest AI, machine learning, like Watson, for example, IBM's Watson, knows more about oncology than any oncologist. So if you know someone who has cancer, I'm gonna give you three choices. Choice number one, a really great oncologist. Choice number two, the supercomputer Watson, who knows more than any oncologist. Or I'll give you one more choice, a really great oncologist that has access to Watson. There in lies how we're gonna work in the future. It's augmented intelligence, not augmented reality. Well, it is also augmented reality, that's another technology. But it's, uh, it's a symbiotic relationship. It's uh, humans have things that we do much better than machines, even the more intelligent ones going forward. But on the other hand, those machines can do a lot of things that us humans are doing today. And what about all the old people that are working? What are we gonna do? And the answer is, well, there's an old saying, you can't teach an old dog a new trick. The good news is we're not dogs. So if you're willing, to learn new things, regardless of your age, uh, wow, you can do amazing things and you'll have a, have a good, prosperous life. Do you think that human plus machine will always be able to stay ahead of machine going forward as we progress further with the technology? Could it potentially just be a hold back? Well, uh, the biggest limitations that humans have can be seen by looking in a mirror. It's us. Uh, in other words, it's our limited view of what is possible. Um, just, just think that we're gonna, I'm going to kind of get on subject, but it'll seem off at first. And that is, just think for a second. You think most of the people that are passing away in old age because they've managed to live long, let's say in their 90s, you think they've discovered all that's inside of them? Or do you think most of them are leaving the planet with a lot of what's inside yet undiscovered. My instinct is, and I've done no research on this, but uh, I've met a lot of people. I think most people have not discovered all that's inside. In other words, maybe you're an amazing flute player, but you've never picked one up. Uh, you see what I'm getting at? So I think that we have just scratched the surface of what we as humans are capable of. And frankly, we're coasting through life. That's why I said it's time for us to play our A game. Stop coasting. You can only coast uphill so long, gravity takes over. Uh, and gravity, by the way, is di digital disruption. <laughs> so uh, let's, uh, let's discover what's in there. And I think when you start actually discovering all that's in you and really opening your mind up to the creativity, there's only so many keys on a piano been the same way since Beethoven and before. Does that limit you, keep you from writing something that's amazing that no one's ever heard before? The answer is no. So when we start bringing the real version of us to the table, there's, a, there's an infinite up. Uh, and by the way, technology, AI, machine learning, oh, there's a lot of it that, that can happen. There's something called the cognitive domain that most people would not know of, but the lower levels of the cognitive domain is where AI and machines uh, function best. The higher levels, which is analysis, problem solving, synthesis, uh, and so on, that higher thought levels is where actually humans shine. Most of us just aren't using that. We tend to talk to our friends and people, places, and things instead of ideas, concepts, and, uh, and higher level thought. So change the conversation and, um, and learn more and uh, explore more. And we find out that all of us have a bright future. When it comes to robots, if you can't beat them, join them. And I, I imagine that's what humanity's future is because if not, I'm not sure what humanity's future will be. That will be potentially problematic. What, uh, speaking of problems, what are you most worried about? Is there a technology, a trend, something that gets you a little, gets you a little worried, keeps you up at night? I, I, in a way, I kind of answered that before, saying the more powerful the tool, the bigger the up and the downside of it. So CRISPR and AI and machine learning that I said were such great tools have me very worried because uh, you could very easily uh, alter uh, the human race 
uh, you could do it in a way that passes along generation to generation, not just the person that you did the gene altering to. Uh, so we could create, you know, what do we want to create? What do we want us to be? It could be, uh, it could be something that could go astray on us. Just like with AI, all of us have watched Terminator 1, 2, 3, and 4, and uh, Terminator 1, 2, 3, and 4 could also play itself out um, in some way as well. So I think one of the things that I really want us to do in being anticipatory is to anticipate problems and then pre-solve them so we don't have them. That's why you've got people like Elon Musk and... Uh, uh, Hawking is not with us anymore on this planet, but uh, and some others that have warned about AI. And what they're trying to do is just say, look, there's some predictable problems that you can deal with, or you can just let them play out. Maybe we ought to start dealing with it right now, which I'm advocating is a good thing, because we can take something and make it better, or we can see how it goes. And passively receiving the future is not what I'm all about. What I'm about is having us actively shape a better tomorrow using new tools and asking ourselves, what does better mean? What is that? So if we want a more connected, a more human, a more humane future, a more enlightened future, hope is not a strategy. Let's roll up our sleeves and start making it. And by the way, there's some ways you could do that and also make some money if you really wanted to combine the two. Because we need your help because there's a lot of people that aren't playing, aren't playing positive games. I got two last questions for you, Daniel. First, where's your inspiration come from? Is it sci-fi? Is it books? Is it other writers? What is it? Um, first of all, I, uh, I've probably given close to 3,000 speeches around the world, and I've had audiences as big as you know 20,000. That's not my average, but that's a large group. But point is I've been around and he, people give me inspiration everywhere. Uh, people that have decided to not be ordinary, but have decided to do something extraordinary because all of us have the extraordinary within us. Most of us don't let it out. And I'm encouraging all of us, hey, why don't you find out? You got something extraordinary in there. Why don't you let it out? And every now and then I see old people, young people, uh, poor people, rich people, I see people doing something that is like a wow, extraordinary, and it gets me excited and it inspires me. Even if they don't have arms and legs, I've seen people do amazing, unbelievable things. So that is that is something I travel around. I see that everywhere I go, and that's exciting. And then the other part is we have tools today that are amazingly inexpensive and the price is getting less and less that it give us the ability to do more and more. And it's up and because we can determine whether we want to do something in a positive way or negative, I just want to, us to all encourage people to do the positive and uh, to build that better tomorrow. And like you said, a few minutes ago, there, uh, there are bad people out there. Well, you know, I'm not going to let them keep me from doing something good. Uh, you know, we have a choice as to what what role we want to play in this uh, this big role that we have on this planet. Uh, let's choose choose wisely. Make it a good one. Elevate it. Be extraordinary. Great power, great responsibility, right? Anything else you'd want to leave people with? Quote it called action. Yeah. Um, first of all, something that costs you nothing. So you know, I'm not selling you something. Uh, and that is, uh, if you go to my website, B-U-R-R-U-S dot com, I've got a blog that's got a couple million readers because I think it's got good content that that kind of shows that. Uh, you can do that. It doesn't cost you anything. Um, I'm on a number of social media platforms. LinkedIn is one. I've got over a million connections on there because I share a lot of great insights. Join the conversation. Jump on in. Um, and then, um, and then... It might seem self-serving, but I'm very passionate about it. I think uh, getting a copy of my uh, latest book, Anticipatory Organization, would be uh, worthwhile. And frankly, I'm going to do something right now. I'm going to give everybody a hardcover copy, a hardcover, not digital, who's listening to this. Uh, so I'm putting my money where my mouth is. And that is uh, if you go to the, T-H-E-A-O book, the A-O, because it's called the Anticipatory Organization. So theaobook.com. 
um, you'll have to pay a couple bucks for shipping. I'm not making money on that. And it'll be FedEx to you within four days. You know, get a hardcover copy. And I'm giving it away because I know you'll love it and recommend it to a friend and I'll end up doing fine. It's a smart strategy. Do good, uh, do good to get good. Daniel, thanks for coming on. It's been a, it's been a lot of fun. Anything else? Anything? No, but uh, only, only to say thank you for doing this, uh, this interview because, uh, and, and other interviews that you do because your, uh, the questions that you ask are very good. The insights that I'm sure your other guests share are great. And, um, and you are good at this. So I'm glad you've chosen this as uh, a way to, to uh, empower others with uh, your own questions because you could pull more out of me or less out of me and you do a good job. Yeah, it's a, fun, it's a fun way to meet interesting people and get interesting ideas out there. You got it. Thank you. Yeah, sweet. Cheers, guys. If you like it, remember it's disruptors.fm. We changed the brand name because we don't want to be recognized as the crazy UFO one. So disruptors.fm. Uh, talk to you guys again soon. Cheers. Awesome. That was fun.